Good evening, everybody. It's just slightly past six. Apologies for the delay. Um, I've just been told there are slight IT issues at uh, exec scrutiny last night. So if you press your um, communicator for uh, your mic to go on, you might not get the relevant face on the screen. It's working for me. But if you get Jonathan's face and mixed voice, it's a mix up on the IT, but just be aware of that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I didn't say that. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, apologies. Um, Chris Poulter, um, I'm standing in, obviously. Um, any other apologies? No? Okay, late items. There is one. Um, just going to uh, say that item seven is the recommendations from Exec Scrutiny uh, Board, but what I'm going to do is take the recommendations on the late item two um, at this time, if that's okay, and then we'll revert back to the standard agenda. So item two is uh, D2 N2 Career and employ Employability Hub. Um, Andy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you to Cabinet for agreeing to take this late report. Uh, this report seeks Cabinet approval for Derby to join with the local authorities that make up the D2 N2 footprint, which is Derby, Derbyshire, Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, to jointly bid for a grant from the European Social Fund to develop a careers and employability hub. The proposal is that Nottingham Futures would host the bid, which is positive for D2 N2 since they already have the necessary infrastructure in place. The overall aim is to engage and enable small and medium-sized enterprises to raise awareness of the business imperative of working with local schools and colleges to build a talent pipeline of future employees where recruitment can sometimes be difficult. There are nearly 72,000 SME businesses in the D2N2 area, so there is great potential with this initiative. Through this initiative, employers will be given the opportunity to partner with schools and other organisations that work with young people to provide inspiration and information about job opportunities, new technologies, information about business development and where there are local skills shortages, all young people and all those close to them. The total pot of funding available is in the region of just over 1.5 million and whilst given the terms of the grant there is a requirement to match fund on a regional basis, if D2N2 were successful in its bid then this would be achieved through existing staff inputting into the running of the project rather than identification of additional funding. So this is a great opportunity for Derby's young people and I would ask Cabinet to agree recommendations 2-1 to 2-3. Thank you. Um, are there any comments on this? Okay, so if we look at the um, Exec Scrutiny Board recommendations, um, Councillor Anderson, did you want to have a comment on that before I pass over to the Cabinet member? Uh, yeah, I can very, just very briefly, um, I, you know, as, as they're laid out there, I think there was um, an interest in making sure that we're singing praises of this project uh, with local East Midlands MEPs. There was some conversation around, um, t to an extent, some of the semantics around it, but, you know, just, just the, the scope and whether it needs to be broadened. And then finally, um, there was a, a concern as to um, what the long-term viability of the funding in a potential for a no-deal Brexit. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in regard to the recommendations from executive scrutiny um, on the first one, yes, we can agree that and we can do that ideally on the D2N2 uh, footprint. Uh, and again, secondly, with the second point there, yes, again, in principle, um, we can agree that and we'll consider it in light of the terms of the grant conditions with our D2N2 colleagues. And finally, on the third point with the Brexit point, it's noted, but actually given that there is already a commitment to existing ESF projects being honoured, a deal or no deal Brexit should not impact on the viability of this project at all. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, okay, if there's no other contributions, we've been asked to um, agree recommendations 2.1 to 2.3. Are we all agreed? Okay, thank you. Okay, so that's dealt with item two, late items, uh, move on. Uh, receipt of petitions, I'm not aware of any. Um, item four, identification of ur urgent items which call in does, uh, will not apply, I'm not aware of any. Uh, five, are there any declarations of interest? No? Okay. Uh, item six, minutes of the meeting held on 12th of June 2019. Are there any? Move, okay, move as printed, thank you. Um, I've already dealt with item seven. We're going to take the executive scrutiny board recommendations on an item by item basis via the agenda. 
Um, so, if we can move to key decisions, it is uh, item eight. So, Adults Commissioning Transformation Programme and Procurement. Andy? Uh, thank you, Chair. So, uh, in adult social care, we are well underway in undertaking a transformation of the way the Council works with citizens and providers and how care is commissioned for customers with eligible social care needs. The purpose of this report is to seek Cabinet approval to agree the procurement of a set of approved provider lists for adult social care, which would then be used to secure cost-effective and quality services for people with assessed eligible needs under the Care Act 2014. Uh, the overall aim of this programme is to ensure that the Council effectively manages the local market of care organisations, ensuring services are available, affordable and of sufficient quality to meet the needs of local people. And this is one of the statutory duties of Councils under the Care Act. The proposed procurement programme is outlined at 4.2 in the report um, and is structured around four contractual approved provider lists. It might help to think of an approved provider list as a schedule of trusted traders where we have carried out checks and due diligence before they go on the list and where we can either commission directly or encourage a mini competition in how they secure work. The four approved provider lists will cover home care, supported accommodation and living, residential and nursing care and day opportunities. As outlined at 4.3, we have designed a timeline so that we run a procurement in close succession between now and September. This means that we can carefully stagger implementation of each approved provider list with the overall aim to have them all in place and delivered or delivering by March 2020. Finally, it's worth noting that there's been a robust stakeholder engagement with four market events uh, taking place with care providers across all service types, which were very well attended and informed this process. In addition, we also talked to our social workers on the front line about the range of provision they think we need. I would ask Cabinet to agree the recommendations at 2.1 and 2.2. Thank you. Roy, would you have any comments? Can I uh, support what Andy has said as uh, lead on this and explain that some of the issues are around legal compliance and some of them are around contractual compliance and we seem satisfied that the work we are currently doing uh, on compliance will give us a trusted trader charter of approved providers across the city and will deliver our aim of making information available to as many people as possible in a proper controlled manner that is safe for all users. Thank you, Councillor Webb. That's excellent. I think it's a, a very solid way of moving forward. Are there any... Um, Councillor Shanker. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, looking through the paper, it's a, it's a vital piece of work. It's, it's a piece of work It's really important, I think, for the Council to make sure um, we get it right. It's needed, given the financial position uh, of, of the Council. And I think, uh, I hope the Chair of Exec Scrutiny will cover this uh, in a second, but the three recommendations from uh, exec scrutiny was just to really uh, bolster the position of uh, once we select these uh, traders, we've got a, a position of real confidence that they're supportive of the values of the council uh, and where service users are using these, uh, uh, these companies, they've got that level of confidence uh, that they support just not just the, in the care world, but also their audit governance and uh, duty of care to their staff is, is also as robust as the, uh, the care they provide. Okay. Um, thank you. Any more? Oh, Councillor Skelton? Yeah, I'd particularly um, uh, like to welcome the, um, uh, the service directory part of it that will be available to the public um, and others because at the moment, you know, you're just taking pot luck really when you're trying to find some uh, a provider, a care provider for, for a relative. So having that um, as a, as a back up knowing that the council's done all these these um, checks is going to be very helpful i think and also protecting the, of the vulnerable people that are receiving the services absolutely i think we all agree with that and uh, thank you for the contributions um councillor anderson um, in terms of the exec scrutiny there were three um recommendations would you like to give us an overview 
Yep, no problem. Um, so uh, the first recommendation was that, I mean, all of them very broadly are about um, using our position um, as, the, as the procuring partner um, to make sure that we're um, sort of using our position um, you know, economically to, to ensure good practice within the services that we're procuring. Um, so the first one uh, talks about um, the quality of work uh, for the carers and that we're doing everything we can to ensure that they adhere to a standard. Um, the second one um, looked at making sure that we, uh, where, where, where possible, we're looking uh, to um, utilize an audit trail and, and, and be really carrying out an audit on the companies that we're bringing in. And the third one uh, was to um, look how providers can work towards minimizing their carbon footprints um, and obviously makes a, a recommendation on, on how that's done. Um, so yeah, very broadly um, around procurement practice um, and taking some level of depth on that. Okay, um, I think I'll, before I pass on to um, Councillor Webb or, or um, an officer, I think the, I can deal with the third bullet point. Uh, I, we are going to be talking about a little bit about this probably later on in, in another item, but certainly um, I'd like to note it, uh, the, the work that we're going to be doing will encompass um, this area of, of um, of activity uh, because this is not just Derby City that is going to be um, delivering more sustainable travel options, although we are uh, going to be leading on a lot of that work um, and to reduce carbon footprints, it is a partnership in the city. Um, we're going to be doing many things that work with companies, with agencies, with, with everybody that lives and works in the city. So actually um, that is going to be encompassed anyway and is already in train in terms of, of what we do. So I'm going to note that um, that bullet point, that third bullet point, and I think that's been that's going to be dealt with and is, is currently being dealt with. In terms of the first two, um, my, my assessment of it is that um, much of this would be part of the framework in, in, in any case. I mean, is there any comments that, that uh, Councillor Webber can make to, to contribute to that? On the first bullet point, Chair, there is uh, an encouragement for all potential providers to sign up to Unison's Ethical Care Charter. So that's the benchmark for good working practices within the uh, organisation, and we can and will monitor care first and foremost and uh, although we cannot uh, determine what the workforce is we can monitor particularly if there are any concerns raised so I think we are pretty sound on that as part of our normal contractual requirements and I would recommend that we note. Okay, thank you Councillor Webb. Um, on that case then, uh, the thank you very much for the recommendation from the Executive uh, Scrutiny Board. However, Chair, sorry, uh, yeah. item two, so the second bullet point, I was going to do, you've dealt with item yeah, three, which ahead, I yeah. wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, so on item two, it is the Care Quality Commission who will consider governance and audit matters, although we have the ability and currently use our internal audit to assist where compliance matters uh, concerning contractors are concerned. So again, I would note that, but it is part of the Council's procurement process. Well, thank you for that assurance, uh, Councillor. So, um, Executive Scrutiny, bullet points one, two and three, we're going to note those. Uh, if there aren't any more contributions, we're being asked to um, agree recommendations 2.1 to 2.2. Are we agreed? Thank you. Okay. Item nine is reintroduction of blue bins to Arboretum, Normanton and Mackworth. Um, Simon? Okay, this, this report is looking uh, to, to reintroduce the, the blue bins to the Arboretum, Normanton and Mackworth area. 
So the council has reviewed uh, the waste collection in these areas and is looking to offer additional recycling collections within the area. Uh, this will aid the, uh, in meeting the government targets for reducing the volume of uh, waste sent to landfill uh, and along with the, uh, the recently implemented garden waste service as well as positively contributing to the climate change agenda. Um, Cabinet previously um, considered a report on the 15th of May uh, 2013 which covered a number of waste issues and as part of, this, of that report um, the recy dry recycling was removed within these three areas for certain parts of it uh, and this was due to high levels of contamination and bins on streets. So the recommendations are to agree uh, to introduce an opt-in service for the blue bins within these areas um, and it's to improve the implementation of the service in a staged approach. Uh, we're asking those households who uh, will still have a blue bin from the previous service to register and, and come online from the 5th of uh, November. And we're also asking those households who wish to take part in the service but don't have a bin from the old service to also register and we can buy those bins for those uh, residents. We're looking to approve the inclusion of £12,500 into the 1920 capital programme and to cover the cost of the purchase, which is will cover the cost of the purchase of the new bins funded from direct revenue. Um, this amount assumes uh, a 5% take up for this service uh, based on an estimated 11,000 properties currently without the bins. So with regards to the engagement, uh, the council will look to communicate and engage with residents in the relevant areas to ensure the benefits of the scheme are understood uh, and maximised for the communities and for the council. Um, other options that were considered, um, we did look, to look at an option to deliver a, a blue bin to every uh, household within these areas, uh, which would be approximately 11,000 bins. Um, the, the cost of this was around £220,000 to do this uh, and not considered at this point value for money. Um, this would also increase the risk of contaminated bins, uh, bins on streets and then unknown costs um, from, from suppliers when we're delivering additional contamination uh, to sites. Um, and it's also to note that at the point of removing uh, the bins, there were recycling hubs were put around um, the areas, but unfortunately, um, these have not been successful. So the dry recycling has estimated revenue impact of an additional £45,000 in 1920, and then an ongoing requirement of £23,000. Uh, the additional costs will be identified and managed within the resources and budgets within waste management. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smale. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I just want to thank officers for their time on this one. I think it was one of the first things that um, I raised up when I first became Cabinet member of this portfolio. Uh, I think there was, uh, there is a natural demand, there's always a natural demand for recycling and there was some massive legal implications for not having recycling facilities in those three areas or those 70 streets. So um, it was important for us to bring this back and uh, whilst it's not a fully imposed system on us at the moment, there's going to be a lot of work behind the scenes to help progress this much forward. Whilst we have aimed for 5% at the moment, that doesn't mean that we are stopping at 5%. It means we can keep pushing on. Um, I have spoke to some of the ward councillors today, actually, and uh, there was some positivity, uh, especially from the Arboretum councillors, who uh, obviously gave their points of view towards me, and uh, they were quite encouraged of it. Um, there's a lot of work going on at the moment with regards to recycling, as you know. Um, Hopefully, when there's a new formation of a government, uh, DEFRA have been doing a lot of background work into um, recycling. There is a big, you know, there's not just a mouthpiece about this, uh, you know, or a whole meal piece about it. There's a lot of areas. We've heard all sorts of rumours that, you know, where bottles could be coming out of blue bins and collected separately. Food waste might have to come out of brown bins. So um, there is a lot of work going on for the future, depending on what DEFRA rubber stamp into legislation. So um, I'll be asking officers to revisit this uh, on a year-by-year -year case along with the brown bin scheme uh, and help push this forward. We have got four waste minimisation officers 
they'll be uh, out there on the streets able to promote it and I'm sure the comms team will be there ready to stretch their eyes and push that out. Um, I certainly want to go out myself, help deliver some of these blue bins like I did with the brown bins. I think there is a real need and appetite in these three areas. And I think there's a lot of work to be done with the student population in the Mackworth wards. Um, I think going out to some of the universities, pushing out the recycling agenda, help them understand what they can do to help push up our recycling rates. Because we have got to meet the demand of 50%, and we still don't know what the implications are for that if we don't. Uh, so um, very much excited about this scheme. And um, in regards to the executive, uh, well, unless you want me to pass over to Councillor Anderson with regards to the executive. Yeah. If we'll just pause you there, Councillor Smell, you make some very good points there. We'll, we'll talk about the uh, scrutiny just in a, a short while. But the, the point you made actually about students is a good one because um, obviously we're, we're encouraged, well, we're, the university is, is going from strength to strength and it's pulling in um, students from, well, some cases all over the world uh, or all over the country, certainly. And um, although most cities, most councils now are having to, whether they like it or not, and we embrace it. Um, the recycling agenda and ensure that we do that. There are still um, differences, either no recycling at all or, or different coloured bins and everything else. So I think you're absolutely right there. There needs to be full engagement there with the student population because they need to buy into this just the same as residents do. You know, we, we, although we've had a dip, we've talked about that and debated that um, in around 2012 when the previous administration took a different turn, um, and we're building that back up. But part of building that back up is communication and getting not just the residents that uh, were, were around and, and remembered the previous schemes that, we, that this council launched and, and did really well at, um, but obviously new residents, um, those buying homes for the first time and settling down with new families that may not have been um, uh, you know, in the position to run a household or, or that kind of thing back in 2010 to 12 really need to engage with these people to actually get them fully on board because we haven't got a choice. It's, this isn't a luxury anymore. This is going to be imposed on us. There's going to be many, many things that are imposed on us, targets. Um, as you've mentioned, various things might change. So we have to be on our toes to actually deal with those things but also take this issue extremely seriously. Uh, and it does uh, lend itself, obviously, at the centre of everything we're doing with regards to our climate change agenda, etc. So. Absolutely right, Councillor Smell. I commend you and your officers for for the hard work that you're doing, and we and we know there's a lot of hard work to go, and this is just the start. Councillor Anderson, um, so executive scrutiny um, put forward um, some recommendations. Would you? Oh, it's two actually. Would you like to just give us an overview? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so um, the first one uh, was that a plan was developed uh, for a full return. Um, I think this is something that we were already told essentially was in the long-term planning, um, but uh, it was put forward as a recommendation um, that we try and return to the, to the sort of structure that happens throughout the city. Um, and the second one um, is uh, that the uh, Exec Scrutiny Board um, commends the Cabinet member. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd like to announce, and, and Zena, this one is probably one you want to get in writing, um, that I have applied for a Blue Peter badge, um, but unfortunately they've told me that I can't provide one, but yeah, we would like to commend the cabinet member for the reintroduction of the blue bins in the areas of the city that currently do not have the means to recycle. I have that impact on everyone. Thank, thank you. He's, he's, he's not used to praise. He's, he's yeah. used to a lot of hassle. It's, it's, Can, so, Councillor Smell, if you'd like to just um, maybe yeah, run through those two things. Absolutely. Um, I can't take any credit from this because, uh, obviously, as a cabinet member, we offer political oversight and you know strategic overview. I've got a hand my praise or to Simon's team, everyone in waste management who have really worked really hard to push out the brown bin scheme and, they've, and, and I've shoved this on top of them uh, to bring out two schemes out in such a very short space of time has been absolutely incredible and, uh, and then Simon will know when we do push towards the waste management team that you know we, we still will go there the, the, the foot pedal is not going to be taken off when we move this forward so um, we you know fully commend the waste team and you know I'm looking forward to working you know further forward with that uh, with regards to the bullet point for the first one for a plan developed uh, for return, I think that's always going to be the long term long term ambition but we we've got to do it in stage approaches I, I think you know to impose it straight away as Simon quietly pointed out that you know there's already going to be a budget implication of £220,000 to implement but then that doesn't include any contamination uh, costs 
uh, should that, you know, which will most likely happen given that we've got two areas, well, th all the three areas that are quite high transient populations. So uh, it's a case of, like you said, getting recycling rates, uh, a recycling uh, methodology, you know, installed into, you know, the new population when they come and live in those three areas. So I think that is always the long-term ambition, and there will always be a review of this as we go forward. And, you know, like I said, the 5% target is not a target where we will stop. It will keep pushing it. We'll, we'll, we'll push out that comms, push out that message. Recycling is a good thing. It, re it truly is. And, you know, and it is disappointing to see that the rates are so low at the moment, but I won't give up, you know, 50% is not enough, you know, the government's set a target, but why can't we push higher than that? You know, we absolutely must push higher than that. So, yeah, that's my view on the, t the two uh, scrutiny recommendations, so, thank you. So, I I'm taking from that then to note them. Um, are there any contributions, Councillor Shank? Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, firstly, just, I mean, we've heard some good words then, and it, and it is really important we increase recycling, and we spoke about full engagement and the uh, importance of good communications, but it's got to be pointed out, prior to this paper uh, being published, uh, and prior to uh, Arboretum Ward Councillors meeting with the Cabinet Member this afternoon on a different matter, but this matter got raised, there has actually been no consultation with uh, with, with the public in these wards or the ward councillors. And officers took that on the chin yesterday and, and, and uh, um, apologised for that and offered to do better. But I think it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's not about individual officers apologising for, for mistakes. It, it's a genuine sort of oversight. But I think we just need to bear that in mind uh, going, going forward that uh, you know, schemes like this where it shouldn't be any politics really involved, uh, we, get the good, we get good consultation before we get to this stage of a report. Uh, the other point I'd, I'd, I'd like to make, and it would be remiss of me if I didn't, um, uh, the legal advice uh, obviously is, you know, we need to be compliant. We should have a, uh, or we should offer recycling across the city. Uh, but the previous uh, administration, when that uh, decision was taken, the legal advice there blatantly was wrong. And I, I hope that mistake wouldn't be, be repeated again. But it, this wasn't uh, an administration acting illegally on purpose. The advice from officers uh, at that time was, was wrong, and, and, and that should be noted. Uh, I'm still slightly confused, though, and I, I, I tried clarifying this yesterday. 5% um, is, is a low target, but it's a manageable target, and everyone uh, is aiming for higher than 5%, and, and we all hope it, it is higher than 5%. But if we get towards 100%, what we, I think I'm hearing is it then becomes unviable and unsustainable. So we need to do some work with the budget to make sure as we do start increasing, and hopefully we, we do start increasing the rollout, um, adequate provision is made in the budget to be able to support uh, a bigger scheme. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Smell? Uh, now, uh, Councillor Shanker has raised up some very uh, fair points with regards to consultation, and which officers have, have, have held their hands up and, and, like myself, will do that. Um, but I think in terms of the consultation, it, and which you pointed out, which kind of follows on to the legal implications of uh, bringing this forward, is obviously that if we don't act now, we are under a judicial review proceeding. And uh, obviously, I'm sure that wasn't the intention of the previous administration, but obviously the new Risk, risk of, Councillor Smell. Pardon? Risk of. Risk of, yeah, sorry. Not, there yeah. isn't one on the way. No. No, it's a risk of, sorry. Sorry, you can tell I don't do don't, law. Don't scare me. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the risk was there. So, uh, and, but, you know, like I said, we, I met some of them, not uh, all of the councillors, but, you know, we will have that engagement with them. Um, with regards to the budget, you know, if there was, I mean, yes, I'd love a 100% take up. Um, and actually, there would be some offset of that. To, um, uh, budget with diversion of waste and because if we get 100% take up that must mean the intention is 100% non-contamination which means it will be cheaper on the budget in terms of not having to pay a contamination charge so yes there will be a play with the budgets as each year progresses uh, so we can push those uh, agenda forward in, in increasing recycling weight, rates in those three wards so but absolutely valid point yeah Thank you. I'm just going to bring Councillor Anderson back in. just want to say one more point about the, the, the overarching thing about this is there's two, two sides to this, really. One is recycling is good for the planet. We know all of that. Plastics, etc. We're hearing all the time about the, the, the negatives and, and why we, we should be recycling. If people just want to, in the city, have another reason would be that it's going to help our budget. Um, you know, it will allow us to... to um, use their council tax uh, in a more efficient way. Um, we will be able to put more money into 
services, and there's some discussion coming on that. If we can be one of the best, if not the best, recycling cities, because we can be, because we've been there before, we can be, um, it will have an impact on, on the budget in a positive way. And actually, that is the selling point. Um, and I think that needs to sit alongside um, everything, all the other messaging we're doing here, that actually there is a reason here, There's, there is a reason that we can actually invest in, in local services if you do this, if you help us with this. Um, it's not the only reason, but obviously it's an added benefit to this, and I think that's something which sometimes can be lost and not really explained very well to residents. What, what is, if I'm doing this, well, what am I getting back? What am I actually achieving? Um, you know, I know the plastics aren't going into water supplies and, and seas and that kind of thing. They get that on the TV and news, but actually we need to give them examples of maybe how we can fund something if we reach a certain level of, uh, of take-up. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, and it was just a just a comment, really. Um, and I think, uh, Councillor Holmes, you were absolutely spot on earlier when you said um, about uh, this being about education. Um, for you know, for an example, you can live five yards outside of the city's limits in one of the estates that are bolted onto our city, and you can have a completely different way of dealing with recyclers. Um, South Derbyshire is baffling. Um, you know, I, I stand myself most evenings with. The sheet of paper explaining to me what should go in which bin um, and, and that's something that I think that um, certainly students coming in yeah um, so I certainly believe that um, students coming in from other regimes will will definitely uh, be confused by that but I think that in itself presents an engagement opportunity certainly with students so in a previous and far more exciting life I worked at the Students' Union at Derby, and as part of that, we were constantly looking for opportunities to engage with the local authority in a non-political way in finding opportunities for students to engage with their local community. And a huge opportunity here is that if, if we, we get students around the New Zealand area um, to work together to actually make sure that the right things are happening. I think we've got, it wouldn't cost a lot, they're looking for the opportunities. Um, you might just have to give them a high-vis jacket. But the reality is that this is something that students are passionate about, um, and I think that we should not waste that opportunity. Absolutely support what you're saying there. Councillor Skelton. Thank you. Um, I was just wanting to raise the point about, that was touched on by Councillor Smale, about the, obviously if the, um, tonnage going into the blue bins, because they've now got blue bins, uh, increases, um, the tonnage going into their black bins will decrease. And I think I'm right in saying that the count, it costs the council more per tonne to dispose of black bin waste than it does blue bin waste. So we should start to see um, a, a benefit. I don't know whether there's been any work done number crunching as to when um, the sort of break even point comes where we um, gain more from reductions on the on the black bin costs than we are actually giving out on the costs for the blue bin and so what sort of um take up we need to do that and therefore and and to get those figures out into the public so people can actually see that um you know as we get more and more people onto the scheme um there's more and more savings to the council which can then be put into things that people would like us to which is uh, well we're all agreed i think which is, uh, which is good. Uh, any more contributions? No? Okay, so we're being asked to um, agree uh, recommendations 2.1 to 2.3. All agreed? Thank you. Okay, uh, item 10, Older Persons Housing Strategy 2019 to 2029. Um, Jeremy. Sorry, Martin. It's Martin Brown. Apologies. Brown. For Furry and Fulliger. Um, this report seeks cabinet approval for the adoption of a new older persons housing strategy. Uh, the proposed strategy before you has been widely consulted as detailed within the report. Um, having a coordinated strategy in place will help contribute towards improving housing supply and quality for older people. Roy, would you like to uh, follow that on? Yes, as older persons champion for the city, I'm really Why pleased that, like? about this document. It, it gives uh, developers out there the opportunity to look at what we as a city would like to see provided for older people. 
So starting from uh, affordable housing uh, through to extra care, bungalows, and uh, at the end, then uh, we are looking at residential care and nursing care. So it covers a wide remit for older people. It also covers uh, adapted properties, so those that are adapted for disabilities, those that are adapted for special needs through Disabled Facilities Grant. I am really pleased with this new strategy and I hope the developers out there in the city note this and develop plans around our sites that are currently under construction to deliver an older person's strategy within their housing development. Thank you, Councillor Webb. You're absolutely right. Um, it, it, it is a really important um, report um, and strategy. So, you know, I suppose sometimes we, we as ward councillors, we, um, we learn about planning applications and it's all about supporting residents. It's all about either opposing them and supporting residents on the issues that you have with them or whatever it might be. Um, you know, section 106 and contributions, all these things which we consider, but actually we need to probably take a step back and during that process actually think about what is being delivered and, and, uh, and have those conversations alongside all of that work to try and encourage developers to actually look at, look at these kind of housing strategies that we're good, hopefully going, we're going to be recommending to, to adopt this evening and actually, um, actually take them seriously and actually deliver for the city because we're all going to be living older. Hopefully all of us in this chamber will live to a ripe old age. Um, but with that comes special mobility needs sometimes and special properties and maybe we won't be able to live in the properties that we currently got. Um, you know, we need something more suitable. Um, and the population is growing and getting older. So this is something which is absolutely essential that we start having the conversation and, and that is why it's an opportune time to get this strategy in place so that we can pursue it. So absolutely right, Councillor Webb. I agree with everything you've said. Are there any contributions? Councillor Skelton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I very much welcome this. Um, it um, in some ways reminds me a little bit of the, um, if we go back some years, the Council's um, strategy, um, New Homes for Old, um, which again um, gave sort of signals to the, um, uh, the marketplace and, and which were taken up at the time. And, and we did see, for example, I think, um, uh, provision of dementia care increase because the Obviously, the marketplace knew what the council was wanting, and, and actually, that gave them some security that that was the direction of travel. And I hope, I'm sure, this this will also do the same with this. Um, I'm particularly interested, obviously, in in extra care and looking at the, the amount of units um, that we need further. Um, it's probably about four ex, uh, new um, uh, developments, um, but it certainly would be good to try and get. Uh, them spread throughout the city, perhaps one or even every, in every suburb eventually, um, because it certainly does help um, release family accommodation, which obviously there is a need for as well. Um, and um, uh, people, older people, are then moving into more suitable accommodation um, for, for their needs. So, very much welcome the whole thing. Thank you. Councillor Anderson, I'm going to run through uh, with Councillor Webb or defer to Councillor Webb for the uh, recommendations, but I don't know if you want to give us just an overview of, of what they are. Yep, so uh, first recommendation was that the strategy be referred to full council for approval. Um, the second was um, that options be explored for creating chains, um, which, um, you know, for, so that swaps could happen across chains. Um, and the third um, recommendation was one that was perhaps uh, a little more about semantics than uh, than scrutiny, but um, it, it was it passed through the board, so um, I, I present it here. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Webb. Would you like to just run through those? 
Thank you. Uh, <laughs> very diplomatically put, Councillor. Uh, can I say that uh, with regard to item number one, I don't think I can accept that. Having checked since last night with legal and democratic services, it would create a negative precedent according to uh, legal and democratic services. So uh, referring this to council when it is an executive uh, decision, then uh, I can't accept that. The second option is noted, but that is work that is already done through Derby Homes on social housing, including encouragement for people to move out of under-occupied homes. We can only encourage, we cannot force people. Uh, if they are willing to pay the under-occupancy charge, then they can continue to live in those properties. It would be nice if we could uh, have powers uh, to encourage them more dramatically to come out by uh, persuading them that under occupancy actually takes away uh, the provision for families in uh, tighter accommodation. So uh, that one, we are doing all the work possible. Uh, we can't do it in the private sector, but in the social housing sector, we are working hard with that. And indeed, we do make a fair number of swaps. With the pressure on the housing list at the moment, however, those swaps are becoming less and less. You need a guaranteed property to move into if you want to swap. So it, it's a difficult issue, but we are monitoring it, so I will note that one. The uh, third point on uh, changing the wording to help people move to more appropriate housing before their housing becomes unsuitable rather than when the housing becomes unsuitable. I can't do that because that is not a definitive word before. Is that years before weeks before, months before, decades before. We just cannot accept that. When somebody's accommodation becomes inappropriate, we try and move heaven and earth to get them into more appropriate accommodation. Thank you, Councillor Webb. So um, just to run through then, then uh, first bullet point, um, not to uh, agree. Uh, to note the second and to not agree the third. Um, okay, are there any more contributions? Um, no? Okay, so we're being asked to agree the adoption of the Older Pe Persons Housing Strategy 2019-2029. That's 2.1. All those in favour agreed? Good, thank you. Right. Okay, item 11. Uh, sales of property to uh, Derby Homes. That's mine as well, Martin. Chair. Uh, this report seeks to gain Cabinet approval to implement a more efficient process for the sale of vacant properties from the Council to Derby Homes. Selling properties to Derby Homes can conserve and potentially expand the social housing stock in Derby by furnishing a receipt to the housing revenue account, which can in turn be reinvested in new housing stock for the Council. Uh, delegating authority for such sales to the relevant strategic directors and portfolio holders can help ensure smooth and efficient transfers of empty properties and can reduce potentially lengthy and costly void periods. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Webb? Busy tonight, aren't you? Very busy tonight. <laughs> can I welcome this report? There is one of the recommendations which I do need you to note 
that uh, we are trying to lift the cap of five properties a year. So uh, we are working hard to uh, get this cap. The government have removed the cap on the HRA, which is going to enable us to build and buy more houses, but uh, procuring properties for Derby homes at five a year would in no way uh, assist in uh, trying to expand social housing as quickly as we want. So we are asking for that cap to be lifted. It's an excellent proposal and I commend it to Cabinet. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Are there any other contributions? I think it's important to note, actually, we're going to be asked to, well, scrutiny, by the way, uh, resolve to note the report. Um, we're asked to recommend 2.1 to 2.4, and actually I, um, I know that uh, Councillor Webb is going to be working very hard on 2.4 because it seems, whatever the logic was back in the day or whenever this was put into place, I'm sure it doesn't hold water now. Um, you know, we need to have that cap removed for, for various reasons, as you, as you state, and I think that would be a very positive move and, and allow us to do far more. So I'm very, very happy to have, uh, to have that in there. I know you're going to be working very hard to do that. Well, you already are. I know you are. Uh, so, if there's no other contributions, we're being asked to uh, agree recommendations 2.1 to 2.4. Agreed. Thank you. Item 12, uh, Allenton Market, future proposals. Catherine? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report concerns um, the future direction for Allenton Market. Um, and proposes a number of recommendations um, to deliver our strategy around this. Um, firstly, Cabinet is asked to note that Allenton Market has been in um, a period of decline and the report contains information to demonstrate um, that unfortunately the market has operated at a loss for the last six or seven years. Um, therefore, it's proposed that we undertake a consultation process with stallholders, customers and stakeholders on the potential closure of the market and in addition to that consultation, we also provide an opportunity for traders, community groups or other organisations to put proposals forward to us for alternative sustainable um, operations for, for the market by way of an expression of interest exercise. Um, the report contains a programme for this running through to November this year. And it also proposes to resolve that if no viable proposal is received, um, that the market be closed and the site is um, added to the property disposal programme and sold. The report details the delegated authorities required to deliver this strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Graves has indicated to speak. Councillor Barker, would you like to speak first? Or? Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, Chair. I mean, obviously, I've been in consultation with uh, colleagues and, and officers on this, on this matter. Um, in, in, another, in another life, of course, uh, I happen to have a, a national position in relation to markets. So I think I want it on record to say that um, this council, whilst ever I'm the cabinet member dealing with this particular issue, is not in the habit of closing markets. That's the last thing we want to do. And that's why I think we've come up with this strategy to see whether or not it is viable to actually hold a community market on the site because it's important in this day and age um, for the market industry to lead the way yet again in relation to uh, retail and uh, the small entrepreneur taking things forward um, onto the high street which we all know is in dire problems has got dire problems at the moment uh, it's a favorite phrase of mine of course but uh, one of the things one has to remember with markets is that uh, Marks and Spencer's started on a market stall in Leeds. And so therefore, look where they've gone to and look where they are now. But I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs have started on a market. So the last thing we want to do is actually shut down a market. But sometimes there's also the socio-economic side of it as well. Sometimes it's just, it works equally viably for a community to take it on board rather than for the big brother local authority to actually take it on. 
And so I've seen them from all over the country where they actually work. So this is really an opportunity for the public to show their support for the market and for that particular locality to show support for the market, uh, to take matters forward, and we will help them all the way. Um, I've, I've obviously got more to say in actual fact after uh, uh, councillors has, has looked at the, uh, the recommendations from the executive, um, but uh, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Councillor Graves? Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Um, I think the first thing to say about this is that um, it's a very sad time that we've come to the point where we have to close markets. Um, I remember as a very young lad going to Allenton Market many, many years ago, um, and it was very bu it was bustling, um, and I, you know, it was really the centre of Allenton um, for most of the most of the week at the time. Um, it is a sad time that we've, we've come to the situation we are, um, and I would like to get the Cabinet member to reiterating um, that, that he will work closely with local councillors. As I'm actually in discussion with um, both market users and market traders um, to try and come to um, a, an amicable solution where we can, as you put it, make, let the community take it over. Um, this was discussed in the uh, Joint Neighbourhood Board, the new Alveston and Bolton Ward Board. Um, and so obviously there is, there is some interest from the community to actually do something with Allenton Market, take it over and make it a viable option. I accept all the difficulties that you've outlined because uh, the High Street is, is a difficult place at the moment. It's a very, very difficult place. It's the area where I conduct most of my business. Um, and it is very, very sad when you see small businesses having to close down because they can't make enough money to, to live on. Um, however, I have to say, I do find the open approach by Councillor Mar uh, Barker very welcome. Uh, and it gives a surety that um, any proposal that will be given proper consideration and I hope that this will um, contribute to this very loved facility and that we can actually get something going because there are lots of people in our community that relies on the market. They're not people that can either afford to go to the supermarkets, they can't afford to travel that far and they rely on um, fresh local produce and local products that they can buy locally and support the economy in a local sense. Um, I have spoken to the Allenton Traders Association. They are also sad that, um, that this, this is coming forward and they hope that something can be revived. Um, so hopefully we can all work together to try and come to a suitable proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Graves. I mean, it's an insight there in, uh, as a ward councillor that uh, obviously is going to be engaged in this process, and that's welcome. And uh, I'm sure and I know that Councillor Barker and officers and whoever needs to be will engage at a local level. You get absolute assurance on that, and I know that you know that that will be the case. In fact, it, it's, it's covered in, in, this, in this report. Um, councillor Anderson, so Exec Scrutiny Board um, put forward various recommendations would you obviously as well you, you you're from a, a neighboring ward as well so maybe you'd have some comments on top of that but do you want to give us an overview of the scrutiny recommendations yep so uh, first of all if i give you the, the scrutiny and then yeah i do have a, a comment to make so um so we wanted uh, the, there was a there was a desire in the room to see the the allenton traders association specifically um you know we wanted to make sure that they were involved in the consultation i think there's um the, you know, certainly when myself and Councillor Evans, who are ward councillors from around the local area, were discussing it, we didn't actually mention the words avoid direct trade competition, um, but it was more around the, the fact that we wanted them consulted. But, you know, that's what passed through the committee. Um, also, um, there was a desire that um, point 2.6, um, Roman numeral 6, sorry, I don't read Roman, um, were removed from the report. Um, and it was also um, it, it, they wanted inserting in the covenant that uh, that some form of direct uh, community use um, was was uh, was sort of long long earmarked 
for the area in line with the Allenton District Centre. And then also um, for markets and neighbourhood officers to work with the local community and councillors from the three local wards um, to help generate and consolidate possible plans for the market. Um, and so the, they were the scrutiny recommendations. And just, uh, Chair, if you, I, I, did I say the Roman numerals the wrong way? You know, it, it, there, I don't know what VI is. It must be. VI is it's six. I, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. the wrong way round. Yeah. And then, uh, just if I'm, if if you will, chair, if I can just add my comments as a as a ward councillor, you know, certainly we sit on the same neighbourhood board. Echo everything that Councillor Graves has said. Really, um, there is a there is a desire locally, certainly with the Allenton Traders Association, um, to be consulted on this. And you know, there's lots of ideas that are coming out. Um, and I know that there is the recommendation in there that. Um, that local councillors and um, are, are worked with on this, but certainly any councillor worth their salt will just naturally want to work on this. It's something that has been long, you know, long in my memory as a kid. Um, not quite as long as Alan's memory, might I add. Um, but you know, it's uh, it is an important centre of that community. And what that you know, what people don't want to happen is a situation like the the debacle that we had a, a decade or so ago around Tesco and all the uncertainty there. So, um, you know, uh, anything that I can do as a local councillor, uh, you know, please rest assured that I will be working with the neighbourhood board and my fellow ward councillors uh, to do that. Okay, I mean, there's a few speakers. Um, before um, Councillor Barker probably deals with his view on the recommendations, I I'll deal with the fourth one because I think it needs to be just resolved straight away. You've got a neighbourhood board, um, it's a joint one. Um, naturally, that is going to be dealing with, with joint issues, uh, and this, I'm sure, will be brought to, as, a, as an item, a standing item on, on that particular uh, group of people, um, whether it be your councillors and whoever else you have on that board. So, item four, uh, recommendation. It will absolutely be the case that councillors uh, um, and local stakeholders will be engaged with, because that is the whole, that, that's what the process is about. You have absolute assurance on that. Um, we don't need to do anything other than note that um, bullet point four because um, we will be doing that um, absolutely and your framework within your local board will ensure that that's the case even if we weren't, which we are. Uh, Councillor Shanker. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, we wouldn't be in this position if this was a, a vibrant market and it was being used by lots of people. Uh, and, and there wasn't a loss to the council, I think, as, as Councillor Barker has already said. Uh, but when you talk to local residents in uh, Bolton, Alveston and Osmuston, uh, which neighbours the market site, uh, those who use the market absolutely love the market. Obviously not enough of those, uh, those people are using the market. Um, so I think it's right we do the consultation. I think it's right we involve a wider audience to uh, consult market traders uh, in the actual market wider uh, shopping centres and, and residents of uh, Osmaston, uh, Bolton and Alveston. And the reason the uh, exec scrutiny asked for um, the delegated authority to move forward to the sale of the site uh, out of this report was just so we could ensure that any future um, potential use for that site uh, would have the right level of scrutiny and would have a public report which came out uh, so you could be completely open and transparent and, and justify the reasons for making a decision for that future use. I don't think that should be anything to worry about. I think it shows a sign of a good governance uh, and any future decision um, being able to stand up to that scrutiny. Leaving this in now, uh, and my guesstimation would be in November um, this market would be shut down and turned into a housing estate. And I don't say that lightly. I think that's what will happen if we don't have the degree of scrutiny uh, and justification for this uh, decision to be able to come back uh, through a, uh, a speedy process. It will only be one further meeting uh, at a, uh, an appropriate time in uh, November, maybe early December. So I think that shouldn't be something to, uh, to fear about. It's not going to massively jeopardise any plans, whatever they, they may be, but it does allow for greater open public scrutiny to be able to come back to, to Cabinet. Sorry, just before yeah, Councillor Barker great. comes in, uh, can I just uh, ask a quick question, because I just wanted to make it clear. I, I believe it includes the car park. Can you just verbally confirm that it does include the car park? 
Councillor Barker is nodding. I'm nodding. Yes, um, obviously the, the whole land of the of the current market includes the car park and, uh, and that would uh, move forward in, in that light. Um, in relation to the recommendations, I mean, uh, uh, Councillor Anderson said it in, in as much that uh, he didn't seem to put in the direct trade competition. I, I think we can all agree that the, uh, the Allenton Trade Association will be fully consulted uh, before, this, before any sale, if there is a sale, moves ahead. Allington Traders Association will be consulted during the, the current uh, period whilst we determine whether or not we can actually run a market on there. So, so there's, there's a, an inbuilt assumption into these recommendations that it's going to go for sale. And I understand what Councillor Sanka says. That will be the ultimate that happens if, in actual fact, we can't um, uh, engender uh, the, na the natural the national in the interest, not nat nat national interest, the the local interest in the uh, in the market and and, um, and running it as a community market. I, I repeat again, I don't see why it can't happen. I have been to many places throughout this country where they are absolutely blooming uh, community markets, and those community markets I have seen haven't got the facilities that we would be willing to pass on to them uh, at Allenton. And so, therefore, as far as I'm concerned, from a community aspect, they've got a head start, a big head start. So, um, with two point th uh, the first bullet point, yes, I can accept uh, that um, Allenton Traders Association is fully consulted, but would not agree with in order to avoid direct trade competition. I mean, firstly, that isn't in question at this moment in time. Secondly, I would look to a legal colleague to say whether or not that's actually legal, whether we could actually do that if we, in actual fact, put a stipulation on it that uh, um, the, the land would not uh, be used for, for instance, retail or whatever. I would imagine that's got to come through a planning exercise as to whether or not that we do change the usage of the land. And so, therefore, I, I can't agree with that paragraph I would, I would rather it stop at before the sale proceeds if in actual fact there is a sale um, the second bullet point delegation at 2.6 v1 well there isn't one we know that but presumably they are referring to um, 1v which is 4 which determines whether viable pro proposals have been submitted well again if you read the text at 2.6 it does say that it's the street director Strategic Director of Corporate Resources in consultation with the Cabinet Member. This whole paper has been put together with those Strategic Directors and been put together with the Cabinet paper. I don't see the necessity for it to go back to full Cabinet. And so therefore I would ask that that be rejected. Um, number three, the Covenant being introduced on the sale of the land. I think anybody knows if in actual fact that sale went ahead, you start putting Covenants on land you actually denigrate the actual value of that land. And so, therefore, we would seek, in the first instance, expressions of interest in that land. And again, they would be assessed in relation to what uses they wanted to put to it. And again, it would be subject to, um, to the necessary uh, ramifications through the planning, uh, the planning, uh, council, uh, planning authority. And so, therefore, to put a covenant on there immediately spikes our guns should we come to sell that land in respect of getting the best possible price for that land on behalf of the people of Derby. So I would ask that again be rejected. As for the markets, um, the final one, the markets and neighbourhood officers, yes, of course, there is a consultation exercise being going ahead. I turn to Councillor Graves and do say that prior to this paper actually coming to uh, being published, I did speak to one of his fellow councillors in relation to this and gave him pre-information the fact that this was going to be coming to Cabinet eventually and did ask him to prepare uh, his fellow councillors in relation to uh, the potential um, for them uh, joining with us in trying to get the community to put together 
um, a good uh, proposal in relation to this. And I did say at that time, and I say it now, and I know Councillor Holmes has just said it, the door is open on this one. We want to see the best for this market, for the people of Allenton, and hope it continues as such. All I uh, want to ensure is that, again, Derby City Council don't, are not burdened with a market that, t at, at our level, is losing cash and losing money. And sometimes, it has to be said, could be better run by people outside of the authority. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Councillor Skelton. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, the, there are community markets in other parts of the country and there are um, council-run markets in other places as well that do um, um, that are successful. Um, I was just wondering, obviously, in order to um, give uh, any of the, the people that want to make um, a bid, uh, the traders or, or local community combined, um, to be able to give them a fair wind, we certainly, I think, need to do something by way of um, giving them some sort of professional advice or putting them in contact with other people who have successfully um, done these projects, because otherwise, I mean, we have quite a short time frame. Um, you know, we need to hit the ground running straight away, really. Um, so they they need to be provided with some, um, for want of a better word, professional advice and, and backup, so that they can um, have a, any chance, really, of, of of getting this off the ground. Otherwise, it's just, you know, it's it's not going to have a very good chance of working. Otherwise, we've got to give it all that we can really it's in our interest as a council to see whatever operates there um, as making money um, for the both for the community and also as an income stream for the council so it's in our interests to um, invest that bit of time in helping them and, and getting the best for them thank you um Councillor Barker has as he said he got vast experience in this area so he couldn't be better placed really i don't know if you want to comment on that yes thank you um as I've said, uh, I am uh, a national officer relating to the uh, National um, Association of British Market Authorities, who, of course, advises councils in particular, but uh, over the years their um, expertise has, has broadened into the community and into private markets um, throughout the country. And so, uh, having said that there's an open door policy, quite simply, I would be able to divorce myself from that and give them the necessary information, the necessary phone numbers of people who, in actual fact, are experts in markets and are able to, um, to uh, take the markets forward. In actual fact, uh, whilst Derby is on the map already of um, refurbing probably the most iconic, one of the most iconic markets in this country, which is immediately across the road from here, I can tell you now that NABMAR are playing a full part in actual fact advising this authority in relation to the way forward with that on the interior and so forth. Not only that, uh, we work closely together with the National Traders Market Federation, NMTF, National Market Traders Federation, sorry. Um, and again, I have similar contacts at a very high level with, uh, with that body as well, who in actual fact advises traders uh, as opposed to the local authorities. And so uh, my fingertips is, is all the information that anybody, if they, if they want to ask for it, I can give it to them. That's no problem whatsoever. Thank you very much for that assurance. I knew that would be the answer. That's why I asked you. That's good. Um, so hopefully that gives you some assurance and we can uh, work on this together. Okay. Um, so, just to sum up then on terms of the recommendations, uh, first bullet point to note, second and third to uh, re not to accept, and the fourth to note. Um, any more contributions? If not, we will go to the recommendations or agree recommendations 2.1 through to 2.6. Are we all agreed? Okay, thank you. Item 13, medium term financial strategy 2021 to 2223. Done. Thank you, Chair. We're proposing a three-year strategy as we move into this budget round up to the financial year 2022-23. And this was set about on the basis of the expectation of a three-year spending review. 
that said, I think there is an evolving view that uh, we may just only receive a one-year uh, settlement this year because um, of the legislative delays within government. Um, hopefully we will we'll learn in the coming weeks and months what the actual position will be regarding the spending review and we'll keep that under review um, as we go. The likely, the, the, this uncertainty though is likely to have a, a, a knock-on effect and impact on the government's long-standing commitment now to uh, have their fair funding review of local government finance and uh, their intention to uh, move towards a new business rates retention scheme. I think the, uh, those, those two proposals are also um, probably at risk of not being delivered by 2021, which was the original date for delivery against those two new financial programs. We'll take the section four of the report that gives you uh, an outline of what's contained in this paper. Uh, there's nine sections in the report, and, and over the page on page three, uh, we've set that out in, uh, with regard to a savings strategy, reserve strategy, um, impact on uh, council tax payers, um, a review of our treasury management strategy, which is a statutory requirement. We need to, to bring that into the public domain and through the decision-making process every year, and also our capital strategy as well. So all those five key strategies form part of this paper. Um, our strategy, with well, the, the saving strategy is set out in uh, section 4.7, where there are uh, several key themes that we're going to be working on in the coming weeks and months uh, to see whether we can actually look to de deliver any cashable savings from those, and they're, they're listed uh, for you on uh, page four as well. Within the reserve strategy, at, um, at, at, on the top of page five, this sets out how, due to uh, pressures that we've been facing on, on some overspends and uh, uh, the A52 project on, on the capital scheme and also to, to meet the uh, revenue budget overspend, what there, this report flags up is that um, we need to be mindful that our reserves balances have been impacted upon and we should be looking to replenish those reserves wherever we can over the next uh, uh, three-year period. Council tax, the, uh, the strategy around the levy of council tax is set on and predicated upon the government's capping levels, which are currently at 2%. So all our financial forecasting has been based upon a council tax increase of 1.99%. And uh, again, we'll keep that under review should there be any changes uh, over the coming months uh, as, as we uh, learn more from the spending review. On page six at paragraph 420, it sets out our treasury management strategy. And uh, again, Chair, what I'm recommending to Cabinet is that we continue with a risk-averse uh, approach to treasury management. Uh, I think while investment rates are so low, uh, we should make best use of our cash balances and delay any external borrowing to fund capital schemes for as long as possible whilst we're uh, cash balances are, are, are receiving such low interest, it makes sense to use those balances to best effect rather than borrowing. Over the page, our, our capital strategy sets out um, our um, forecasted capital program costs across the next three years. It also sets out what the, the budget is in, in the current year and our main projects across this period that we will be incurring significant expenditure is set out in paragraph 4.28. Um, if I can take you to page 14 now, the, the, there is an important section uh, with regard to something we need to keep a weather eye on around savings plans and savings targets that we've got in against the current financial year, uh, where we've got significant sums of savings of, of, of over £7 million. The table at paragraph 5.3 on page 14 recognises that um, two of those savings that we had in the medium-term financial plan and the budget for 1920 have been flagged up as already as being undeliverable, and we uh, the, the cost of that is is £221,000, where we're putting in mitigating 
alternative savings in the current financial year, but we will have to put in permanent savings as soon as we can and, and recommend what those permanent savings are to Cabinet um, as, as soon as we're able to. The report sets out what the position is nationally on page 16, um, and I've, re I've already referenced the fair funding review and the business rates review, but there is significant pressures facing all local authorities around our care services within adult social care. Um, the long-awaited uh, government uh, green paper on adult social services is uh, still uh, awaited. Um, when that will come is, will be long overdue. And uh, there's a similar position building around children's services as well, where the, the costs uh, that most local authorities, indeed probably all local authorities, are facing in increasing costs in children's services. Um, over the page at uh, uh, page 18, that uh, brings it into a local context from that national scene. Um, and we've been also building in emerging pressures, as we, we should do at this time of year. We should be flagging up the emerging press pressures and not least uh, they are predominantly in Derby within the care services. Uh, looked after children numbers are, are increasing exponentially. We've got pressures also within uh, special educational needs and disabilities where the numbers of, of, of children in those areas and young adults in those areas are requiring uh, more, more um, support. And also the demographic around Derby is no different anywhere else and the pressures in adult social care also are impacting significantly on our budget plans. Section 8 of the report flags up last month the Cabinet agreed a council plan. Uh, so where we, uh, where we can, we should be aligning all of our spending plans to the council plan, priorities that have been signed off by Cabinet and uh, uh, hopefully will be endorsed by council next week. The final point I would like to reference at this stage, Chair, is for Cabinet to note the position of change that uh, we've encountered in the last few months since we set the budget in February. There's a table uh, on page 21 of the report that builds into our financial forecasts what the position is around the emerging pressures in the middle of that table. That figure is £6.22 million. Uh, we're putting that into the mix as we should. Uh, the impact that that is, is having across the, the next three years uh, compared to what it was in February, the, the, um, the budget gap that we had in February where we needed to make further savings was £7.5 million. That figure is now over £14 million with a, a significant uh, sum of £10.6 million in 2021. So um, we have, have, have tasked ourselves as officers to come back to Cabinet as soon as we can with uh, savings proposals because that will be a difficult uh, gap to meet and the emerging pressures that uh, we're putting on the, uh, in, in the table are, are, are set out in the bottom of uh, uh, page 21 which flags up um, some of the points I've already made around children's but there are also other areas of pressures that also need to be considered as part of this budget process. Chair, there's four recommendations included in the report as set out in section two. Thank you. Thank you for that extensive uh, overview of the report, um, of the strategy. Councillor Anderson, um, executive scrutiny, uh, three recommendations. Would you like to give us an overview of um, how they came about, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first one um, was um, after a discussion around the um, continued pressures uh, nationally and locally in children's services um, and just a, a desire for a, for a balanced budget, I, I guess, as per the law. Um, second one, um, to include in-year savings from other areas slash services if the council, um, if necessary, um, in, again, in line with uh, the legal requirement to have a balanced budget. Um, and the last one, um, so, so what wasn't discussed in the meeting on the last one was around what incentive schemes mean. I, or certainly, I mean, Councillor Shanker may correct me on that, but I certainly don't remember the incentive schemes being mentioned. But the, the theme for the rest of the recommendation was just really around broad consultation of any budgets that happen. Um, 
I think it was noted in the meeting that budgets are always consulted on, but I think this, uh, that you know, the recommendation perhaps wanted more, uh, more consultation than normal. Um, but it passed the committee, and so yeah, there it is. Thank you. Uh, are there any contributions? Councillor Shankar. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the final one was a, um, a convincing recommendation from uh, Councillor Lucy Kerr, uh, and it was incentives, things like if people are offering to mow the lawn in front of their house, uh, and they should get a reduction in council tax for doing things like that. So uh, I, th I think that's something that could be looked at. <clears throat> uh, just moving back onto the report, and, and as, as you've said already, Chair, uh, Don McClough has, again, produced a really extensive uh, report. It takes a lot of work to put this uh, together, and it gives a good overview of the Council's finances. And it's because of that we can clearly see the children's services in this Council is uh, severely underfunded uh, and has been uh, for a while. Last year there was a significant overspend, uh, and the issue here is a base budget problem. Not enough money has been put in the base budget, and now we find ourselves in a position um, not many months after setting this year's budget uh, facing another shortfall for this year. Uh, the reserve strategy says uh, that, you know, we, should we should use reserves to balance the budget uh, with, a, with a caution um, and only as a last resort and, and as one-offs. We're already, this is a two-off because we did this last year and we're already uh, part way through this year already in a position where we're potentially going to have to use reserves to balance this year's budget again. So the point we were making at exec scrutiny yesterday, uh, uh, and, and I'll make it again here, um, we shouldn't be just um, going into a position where uh, we're going to have to draw on limited reserves to balance, the, balance our overall revenue budget because of the problem we have with the budget in, in children's services. We should make them decisions, tough decisions as they are, uh, to fix the base budget, put the money where it's needed uh, in our statutory services, make sure they're properly funded, properly delivered to the residents of Derby, uh, and then we should look at uh, where we are for the discretionary services. There's a lot of projects which, um, you know, I won't go into today, which have been selected to uh, be delivered by this administration, uh, but on the back of having severely un underfunded statutory services. So I think we've just got to wake up, smell, uh, smell the coffee, fix the base budget, and then what change we have left is what we use for discretionary services. And it's got to be like that. And I can't believe we're in a position, uh, you know, it's only, what, July now. We're only three, four months into the new financial year. Massive hole in, in children's services. That, that needs fixing. And I think that's what the point uh, uh, exec scrutiny <coughs> were making last night with the... Um, uh, with the first bullet point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shankar. And Councillor Williams? Oh, Councillor Rawson, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, just picking up on the recommendations, um, and I'm sure you'll have noted this, Baggy, having actually done finances. Uh, the first recommendation refers to the revenue budget from 1920. Uh, I'm sure this report says 2021, 2022, 23. So in terms of that recommendation, you know, that isn't relevant to this report as is. Um, we are looking at this particular MTFP and MTS MTFS. We, you are absolutely right in what you're saying in terms of we are accepting that there is a gap. We're being very open and transparent. We're lobbying hard with national government. But what I have to say is that this gap did not appear overnight. The pressures have not appeared overnight. And that this, the systems that we have inherited and, and going forward um, take time to embed. Um, this, the gaps were already emerging and there was very little done to proactively um, deal with those issues that were arising around all sorts of things. Uh, and going forward, yes, you're right, there, it, it does take time to embed these things and there are things being done and we are being very clear and open with the emerging new pressures that are on page 21, 9.3. Um, and in terms of to include the new in-year savings and other areas, um, the second point, um, to create a balanced budget, that's exactly what this is. It's a budget, and our, our first monthly stroke 
however many we need meetings around this will start to take place our MTFP workshops from the 14th of August with our new financial director when he arrives we're taking it extremely seriously we are looking at every line of the of the budgets and it's not something that we plan to um, hide under the carpet and, and not deal with um, going forward um, that may have been done historically. Um, we are looking at it proactively and we will continue to do so. Uh, in terms of the third recommendation as part of the work this autumn in financial situation with staff and council taxpayers, um, you'd like us to do a consultation uh, and consider incentive schemes. Uh, it, we've touched on the, real, the realisticness of this um, and we are absolutely open door policy and any, any meeting that I have with any member of staff in this building we appreciate, I fully appreciate that they are the people on the ground and they will see the things and the savings opportunities and they know that my door is always open to have those conversations. In terms of incentive schemes, at this point in time, we haven't got the money um, to, to implement them per se. The incentive should be that they are helping Derby and that Derby listed Council needs to progress and in order to do that, um, any sorts of savings ideas that are presented will be considered proactively going forward. Um, I think this is a fantastic report. It's clear, it's open, it's realistic. Um, we are identifying where we're at. That is the point of an MTFS, is to identify what we need to do and um, proactively look, work to do that going forward, not look back at um, the mistakes that may have been made historically, but to look at how we can move forward and, and improve this city. Thank you. Um, Council Williams? Uh, thank you very much. Um, what I will say to you and to all my fellow councillors is you all have a role to play in this. I challenge each and every one of you to go out there and talk to your residents and find this council one foster care family. Because at the end of the day, that is one of our biggest problems here in that we don't have enough foster carers in-house. Now, it's really, really important to our children have our own foster carers in-house because they are brilliant they help the children achieve they help the children grow and they love our children and they are our children so my challenge to you i've already challenged my own group already it's also in my manifesto pledges that we will get 30 new foster care families in this city take that back to your group make sure that they accept that challenge because if you can help do that you will help bring down that overspend in that budget would I like more in the base budget? You can ask every single cabinet member and every single officer in this council that I love it because I go on about it all the time. The fact of the matter is we are where we are with the budget and we have to look at how we can bring down that overspend. Foster carers in-house, big win there. Not only were they better for our children, but it will help us in terms of not going out to independent foster care agencies. And in terms of the high needs block spend, let me just say, taking it out for the last several years out of the reserves and not actually addressing the issue has left us where we are at the moment in time. We are having to address those issues now and we are doing that co-productively with our schools, with our partners, with the local area and we are making sure that we are trying to come up with solutions that are not easy to do because none of them are easy to do and I challenge any of you to say that they are, but to find some solutions there, and I would love to hear any solutions that you have that isn't just about raiding the corporate reserves, because if you've got them, bring them on, because I don't play politics with children's services, and I damn well hope that you don't as well. Bring it on, bring out the results, come to me with some points that we can help to do this. I'm always listening, my team will always listen, so come, and, come to the table and do it. No one so far has come and knocked on my door and offered me any advice on that from your team. Thank you, Councillor Williams. I actually remember making a point, it was when Chris Williamson was still in the council, and um, I was, I don't even know if I was deputy leader at that time anyway, I, I was representing my group on, on a debate on uh, adult care, I think it was, and, and social care, and the pressures and the budgets and everything else, and, and Councillor Williams makes an absolute valid point there that these issues are a challenge for whoever is in administration and this administration um, clearly has a challenge to, to, to meet and we will meet that. Um, but whether it's conservative, Labour, whatever, um, 
that particular issue across many authorities is is there real um, whether you're a, you know a, a Derbyshire or a seaside or a, in a city or whatever you are the local government association uh, conference it was the, the main issue it, it's a national issue not just Derby um, but we have obviously to deal with it in our local area so totally endorse what Council Williams has said. We need to work together on this. Um, it's a challenge for anybody and all of us, um, and we need to uh, try and put politics to one side to actually meet that challenge. Councillor Rawson. Thank you, Chair. If in terms of this debate we are at a pass where we can move on, um, I would like to make a suggestion on the recommendations. Recommendation 2.1 and 2.2 refers to attending this to full council for approval on the 25th of September. Um, in terms of where we are and the discussions that we're having, in order to be as proactive and, and um, uh, plan ahead as humanly possible, I would like to suggest that we consider taking this to the 24th of July, bringing it as a late paper to the 24th of July that allows us then to move on any savings as quickly as humanly possible and to do what we can to, to support this, um, if that could be added, Chair. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so let's just recap on that then. Um, just before we move to that, the exec scrutiny, note all three. Um, and the recommendations, which are 2.1 to 3.5. What Councillor Wilson is saying there is 2.2 be amended um, so that it reads to note the capital strategy and reckon. Sorry, at. Yes. So to note the capital strategy and reckon. No, sorry, to endorse the Council's medium term financial strategy for 2021 and 22 23 and recommend that full Council approve this strategy on the 24th of July 2019. And then again, 2.2, to note the capital strategy and recommend the approval of the strategy to Council on the 24th of July. So both of those recommendations to be amended accordingly. Is that okay? All right, so we are, uh, with that amendment, uh, being asked to uh, approve recommendations 2.1 to 3.5. We agreed. Thank you. Sorry, 2.4. Sorry, I was, uh, yeah, three of the reasons. I do apologise. So 2.1, just to recap, 2.1 to 2.4. Are we agreed? Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Item 14. Thank you for being so patient, <laughs> Heather, if you'd like to introduce. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, last month, uh, Cabinet considered the new Council Plan for 2019-23 to and recommended this for approval by full Council on the 24th of July. The plan contains three headline themes, a city of big ambition, a city of health and happiness, and a Council focused on things that matter, underpinned by a number of areas of focus. The delivery, the delivery plan presented today gives more details on the practical actions that will deliver the Council plan to drive change and secure improvement. Uh, the delivery plan includes um, measures, timescales and accountabilities um, and is an important document to, com to communicate how we will deliver our vision to residents and wider stakeholders. It is not intended to be a comprehensive list of everything the Council does. So as set out at 4.3, um, the omission of any piece of work um, neither implies that it's not a priority nor doesn't add value. Um, as in previous years, the Council will undertake regular monitoring of the plan um, through Cabinet, exec scrutiny and report outcomes through its annual report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Heather. I do have to apologise because I know that you've worked really hard on this and, and obviously I've dipped into it and had my say and it was probably the, the worstly written notes I've ever handed anybody in my life to uh, sift through. So I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid I'm really sorry about that, but you did a great job deciphering what uh, myself and colleagues uh, fed back to you. And um, I'd like to thank uh, the Chief Exec as well for the work that she's done on this because I know it's been uh, something which she's led on. Uh, and yourself and your team. Um, it's a good piece of work and it's something which uh, will certainly stand us in good stead as we move forward. I do, um, I do, I don't want to say that uh, as an administration that we recognise the importance of tackling climate change too. Um, and that's reflected on page seven of, of, of the delivery plan. Um, and I'd like um, to add an area of focus to the plan itself, uh, which fits into the city of health and happiness theme. So, 
I'd like to um, propose the following amendment via an additional, additional item or recommendation 2.4, uh, which would read, um, add to the council plan under the City of Health and Happiness theme an additional item to work with partners to reduce Derby's carbon footprint. I can hand that to, to legal for the, the wording there. So that would be an additional um, recommendation 2.4 as I've just described there. Do we have any uh, con uh, contributions? No. The Executive Scrutiny Board uh, noted the report. Um, so if there's no further discussion, we can agree recommendations. Sorry. Can no, no. Uh, Councillor Wilson, sorry, I do apologise. Sorry, Chair. Just again to um, to thank the team on this. It's, it's a really proactive... Um, forward-looking plan with with clear definition of of where we're heading um, and I think it's a real positive um, that we need to sort of put out there that there are good things happening and we are planning to to move this council forward absolutely we need focus and sometimes it's easy um, for the, the cabinet we're, we're very busy on our various um, agendas and portfolios and taking forward projects and managing and liaising and all the rest of it sometimes it's it's um, easy to forget that we need a plan uh, you know, it needs to be defined, and uh, that piece of work has been done by officers in an extremely efficient and professional way. Um, and it will be something that we can refer to and be uh, judged on as well, and uh, held to account, and follow, and deliver, which is the main thing. Okay, so uh, we're being asked to uh, agree to recommendations 2.1 to 2.4 as amended. Are we agreed? I believe. That is it. Am I right or am I wrong? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.